Welcome to Swangen and part two of Pipe Dreams. I'm Dennis Allen. In part one, we looked at how the gas first developed in the Mackenzie Delta region. Then we talked about the Berger Report of the 1970s and the far-reaching effects it had on the North. Finally, we looked at how the North has changed since that report was made. And now, we'll continue the story of the new Mackenzie Gas Project. The Mackenzie Gas Project is a proposal to produce natural gas from deep under the Mackenzie Delta at three locations. According to the proposed project, Taglu, Parsons Lake, and McGlintock's natural gas fields will be connected to a gathering system. Then a network of pipelines will move the natural gas and natural gas liquids to a gas processing facility near Anuvik. The Anuvik area facility is where natural gas liquids will be separated from the natural gas. Gas processing, gas chilling, and compression and liquid stabilization will happen at this facility. Once this processing is done, the gas will be transported via pipeline to Norman Wells, where it will connect with an existing Enbridge pipeline. From Norman Wells, the gas will be transported to northwestern Alberta. This project proposes that four major oil and gas companies make up what is called the producers group. The ownership in the fields, Shell is a 100% owner of the Neglintac resource base, Imperial 100% owner of the Taglu resource base, ConocoPhillips and ExxonMobil are joint ventured in the Parsons Lake resource base, ConocoPhillips being 75% owner, ExxonMobil 25% owner. Now those four, what we call the producers, have sole ownership of the uh, gathering system, which is the pipeline system to bring the gas and gas liquids to a central processing facility, which would then separate the liquids from the gas. It is at that point that the ownership structure changes again, and now the Aboriginal Pipeline Group, as a full partner with the producers for the gas pipeline, comes into play. And who is the APG, Aboriginal Pipeline Group? Formed in 2000, it represents the interests of the Aboriginal peoples of the Northwest Territories. This group is formed into two companies, the Mackenzie Valley Aboriginal Pipeline Limited Partnership and the Mackenzie Valley Aboriginal Pipeline Corporation. In October of 2001, the corporation entered into an agreement with the four producers, and in 2003, the Aboriginal Pipeline Group became a full participant. APG is a uh, unique alignment of uh, three of the four Aboriginal groups in the Mackenzie Valley. Uh, the Inuvialuit, the Gwich'in, and the Satu are currently uh, members of the APG, and we have a seat reserved at the table for the Decho. They, of course, uh, have the land claim, settlement, and self-government initiative as their number, number one priority right now. The objective of uh, APG is to maximize the benefits uh, through ownership in the pipeline, the long-term benefits to the Aboriginal uh, communities in the Mackenzie Valley. So APG uh, at the moment has a one-third share in the Mackenzie Valley gas project. We would plan on borrowing money to finance our, uh, our one-third share in the project and then repay that loan uh, through our earnings in the project once gas is flowing. The interesting thing about APG is that we are going to be providing dividends on a long-term basis back to the Aboriginal people in the valley. This is not a short-term flash-in-the-pan thing during construction. These dividends will flow for as long as the gas flows. The dividends, however, will be distributed generally in accordance with the distance of the pipeline through each Aboriginal region. Now I said generally in accordance because we do have 8% percent 
set aside for the Aboriginal groups in the Northwest Territories who do not fall directly on the pipeline right away. It was felt that all Aboriginal groups in the Northwest Territories should be able to share in the significant benefits from this very large project. When this project was in its infancy, the government had 14 agencies set up to handle environmental assessment and regulatory duties. It was clear, in short order, that this was not a feasible process for a project of this magnitude. This gave birth to the Joint Review Panel. Brian Chambers explains. The Joint Review Panel, um, uh, and again, that's on the environmental assessment side of the uh, review of the Mackenzie Gas Project, um, it is uh, composed of seven members. And really there are, um, are three uh, organizations that uh, nominated or selected those members. And those uh, organizations are those from those three areas that I mentioned, the Inuvialuit Settlement Region, the Mackenzie Valley, and uh, in northwestern Alberta, where the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency for a transboundary project of this nature has responsibility. And uh, there was a formal agreement among those three parties. And the three parties to that uh, agreement are the Inuvialuit Game Council, the Mackenzie Valley Environmental Impact Review Board, and the, the Minister of Environment uh, on behalf of the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency. Uh, it's the Joint Review Panel Agreement. Um, and it uh, uh, committed those parties uh, to a coordinated environmental assessment of the um, a Mackenzie Gas Project and resulted directly in the appointment of the Joint Review Panel, which, as I mentioned, is a seven-member panel nominated and or selected by those three parties to the Joint Review Panel Agreement. And the last group in the mix is the National Energy Board, a federal body that reviews any project, like the Mackenzie Gas Project, when it crosses provincial boundaries. And this pipeline crosses the Northwest Territories into Alberta. Now we have all the groups in place. Next, we'll see the issues that will need to be resolved and what stalled the whole process in the middle of 2005. All that and more when we return with part two of Pipe Dreams. Welcome back to part two of Pipe Dreams. We've just discussed all the groups that are involved with this project. Now it's time to see what they are doing and if they are filling the roles they were created to. If building a pipeline of more than 1,200 kilometers through permafrost and rough terrain is a challenging undertaking, then getting permission to build a pipeline can be a frustrating experience for everyone who is involved. The wells, the collection stations, the pipeline, will impact everything, from the land, to the people, to the wildlife. First there's the increase in population of the north. I mean, I don't even think our schools are big enough if they're having more people coming into town. And a hospital, I don't know if it's big enough to handle all the people that's going to be here for the pipeline. Then there's the issue of effects on wildlife, and in turn, how that will affect the traditional lifestyles of the north. Like I'm kind of against the pipeline too myself because I'm worried about how far we're going to have to travel to shoot caribou, eh? And I live on the caribou quite a bit. And how far we're going to go to have to hunt geese in the hoiling area, what's going to happen if the line breaks? And how much pollution that'll cause. And what about the process itself? There's concerns that it's not working as well as it should be. In fact, things came to a halt in May 2005 because the process wasn't working. Two factors contributing to that. One is the regulatory process, that uh, we need some clarity on the timeline before us, and we need some clarity on uh, how that process will unfold. We had that clarity in the cooperation plan, but there's been uh, sufficient evidence over the course of the information requests coming in through the regulators as well as uh, some of our experience on the permitting side for the type of geotechnical information I was talking about that uh, suggests there are uh, pathways that need to be better clarified and timelines that need to be more transparent to us before we can proceed. 
And then there's the issue of the Decho, wanting to be recognized for their needs as well. But there are some who believe that the Decho don't want to have the pipeline at all. All along the way, I don't think anybody's ever said we don't want the pipeline. Uh, you know, we have 13 leaders in our area, and I've never really heard that before. Uh, what I've heard today is this uh, concerns and issues with uh, how the process is going, what, what our participation in that process is going to be, and I guess some of the uh, downstream benefits that we're going to realize during the construction and as well uh, during the whole operation of the pipeline and uh, the development of those resources. There are some benefits already being felt from the proposal of a pipeline through the Mackenzie Valley. Communities have been able to, for the first time, formally map family histories and catalog traditional ways in a way that has never been accomplished before. As the producers carried out research for their impact studies, many communities who had passed along traditions orally because they had never had the funds to gather and store the information before, were now being supported to do so. Histories that may have been lost were now being preserved for future generations. Also sacred lands and hunting sites were being mapped and marked for preservation. Social issues like housing, health and education are being identified and addressed on a scale that they have never been addressed before. And some people believe that the Mackenzie Gas Project has also brought economic hope for the future of the North. I, for one, have to stick my neck out and say that I, the North needs this. The North can build hope on this. The North can build sustainability and a future. And the North can find a balance between their cultural existence and securing that and maintaining their language and creating a viable, employed, healthy, group of people who want to continue to live where they live and can continue to live where they live and can do so with a higher quality of life. Jobs, opportunities and new economic potential for the future. To understand this better, it's important to understand what will be needed to build the pipeline system from the collecting fields through the Mackenzie Valley to northern Alberta. First, the right of way will need to be surveyed. It will need to be prepared. This preparation includes grading, the building of pads for the movement of equipment. Then comes the hauling of the pipe to the sites along the pipeline route. That pipe will be hauled from stockpiles along the right of way. A ditch will be dug along the route for the placement of the pipes. The pipe will need to be bent to fit the contours of the land. Special welding techniques and equipment have been developed to accommodate the rigors of permafrost and will be used to join the pipe together. The pipe will be laid into the trench of the right-of-way. There will be installation of valves and special fittings. Crossing rivers, streams, roads and other pipelines will be planned in advance and executed with open-cut techniques or directional drilling. Finally, before testing the pipeline, the trench will be filled. Testing of the pipeline will be conducted utilizing a variety of methods to ensure the integrity of the assembled pipeline. The entire process is expected to take four years and cost approximately $7.6 billion. And over that period of time, it will employ a workforce between 1,600 and 1,800 people. And long-term employment will be in the maintenance and operations of the pipeline. And the Inuvik area facility will need personnel to maintain its ongoing operation. But will station crews and maintenance crews be enough to sustain economic development in the north? So that's my biggest fear right now is these guys that's coming in saying there's going to be a bunch of jobs. And right now the kids will say, oh yeah, okay, okay, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. But after the pipeline is done, they probably only need 10, 10 or 20 people to run the plant and that's it. But they're saying they're going to have jobs for 25 years. I mean, they'll have probably 10 or 20 people watching the facilities for 25 years. And what they're going to do once the pipeline is done, who's going to look after it? Who's going to take it out? We'll be stuck with it in the ground. 
They're not going to look at us after all the gas and oil is out of here. Of a mystery when you've never seen one. Development is a mystery when you haven't experienced it. So naturally, there's a there's a degree of fear. There's a degree of wanting to stay comfortable with that which you know, namely no development. Having said that, there is concern about the youth. What do the youth have to look forward to? How can we ensure our youth get training and education? There is concern about people who do get training in terms of where do they get a job? Must they leave the North in order to be employed? If they leave the North, then who maintains the cultural viability of the community itself? Is there an erosion of that? Do people lose their connection with the land, not just with the people? A lot of mixed emotions. What's next in the Mackenzie Gas Project? That's what we'll be talking about when we return to part two of Pipe Dream. Welcome back to part two of Pipe Dreams. 2006 is another year of hearings for the Mackenzie Gas Project. The Joint Review Panel and National Energy Board will hear from the people of the North and from the proposers of the project. From the time that the Mackenzie Gas Project was formally presented, there have been batteries of studies done by the producers group. And many groups have come to the North to explain what having the pipeline will mean in terms of land use and social impact. What this meeting is about is it's the, it's the second in a series of three workshops. We're really providing a forum for them to get together and identify short-term, long-term, I guess medium where we're at now, goals and, and impacts relating to the pipeline and, and social, social impacts. What we can do to mitigate them, um, what, what gaps we need to identify, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. That's what these workshops are really hoping to identify. Developing communities of expertise within the communities to draw off in some of the communities where there's a lot of abandoned buildings, we need, you know, obviously something to be looked at there and there'll be a plan in place to, you know, there's a lot of services that are needed uh, to do something with those, whether it be turning them into housing units or using them for a better use. The obvious one that we all think of is money. It's going to take funding and financing. We were uh, invited up by the, uh, the uh, community corporations uh, to do a, a series of workshops about the oil and gas industry and, and the environment and social issues. And it's a sort of a third party uh, information. So we're not here um, representing industry or government. And we have no uh, direct stake in the, in the pipeline project. And uh, our, our main, our mandate is to, here is to try and provide people with information and knowledge that will be useful to the people that need to make decisions about oil and gas in, in the future. And be talking about environmental issues, and uh, on the question of will it, will there be impacts? The answer is is yes, because the, the oil and gas industry, by its very nature, is an, an intrusive industry. It it needs to have facilities that are on the land where the oil and gas reserves are. It needs to have pipelines that connect the wells to each other and and to gas plants. In the end. Some of these groups have helped northern residents to identify, understand, and request solutions for some of the anticipated social and environmental impacts. So what needs to happen now? Well, uh, we just have to get to some conclusion on the social impact, funding discussions with the federal government in a very quick, quick way. Um, the access and benefits agreements have to be dealt with by Imperial through with the negotiations with the Aboriginal groups. Uh, the joint panel review should get on with its job. Um, I know that um, some people have some expression of there's gaps, but I don't recall in any environmental review where every question was answered, and a lot of people will be bringing up those gaps and those concerns, and they will have to be dealt with. And the dealing with it will be beginning in earnest as the next round of hearings with the Joint Review Panel begins in February of 2006 in Inuvik. The panel's hearings will be held across the Northwest Territories for the entire year and will finish in Inuvik at the end of November. The National Energy Board hearings started in January of 2006 
and are scheduled to finish in December of 2006. If the outcome of these hearings are favorable, then the Mackenzie Gas Project's pipeline is anticipated to begin construction in 2008 and be ready for full production and pumping gas down the line by 2011. The Mackenzie Gas Project is one of Canada's most ambitious projects. Some compare its impact, complexity and immensity to the building of the Transcontinental Railway. And just as the railway affected many people and changed the face of Canada, so too shall the pipeline of the North. And no matter how much it is carefully planned and executed, it will change the North and the people who live there forever. Some say the change will be for the worst. These are the people who are concerned about losing their traditional life under new social and environmental pressures. Others say it will be for the better. These are the people who are looking for a brighter and better economic future for the North. Yes, I am. Uh, so the people could work. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All the people could have jobs. Well, I think that uh, certainly provides some economic opportunities for our people. There's uh, certainly employment and trading initiatives and capacity building that can be done through these initiatives. But I think uh, probably First Nations want a little bit more than that. I think they want to be a part of the action. They want a part of the big pie and rather than just providing services and subcontracts and those types of uh, things. I think that people want to be a, an equity owner in, in these resources that we, that we say are part of our treaty and are part of our land. Myself, I see a lot of uh, younger people benefiting because you know they're working and uh, uh, they're, they're making a living for themselves and their family and you know I think that's that's one thing that people sort of forget is uh, uh, with this you'll have you'll have problems but you'll have people also benefiting from it. APG's mandate is to maximize the benefits uh, to the Aboriginal communities uh, in the Northwest Territories from the development of these resources. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, we don't want to uh, stand by and watch this happen. We want to be part of making it happen and ensure that that development takes place in a manner that does maximize benefits. Benefits such as uh, employment, training, and uh, contracting opportunities, plus the long-term dividends that will be uh, very important not just to uh, uh, today's Aboriginal people in the valley, but to our children in the future. You can't turn back the time. Um, we, we have to make sure within the process we, we look after the resources that we have and the value of the land and the environment, and that's our job to do. Um, to say that uh, you know, you pick one or the other. I don't think Inuvialt have to pick one or the other. They have to have both. Thank you for joining us for our story about the Mackenzie Gas Project Pipe Dream. Tune in again next week for more of Swang and Our Strength right here on APTN. Until then, I'm your host, Dennis Allen. Kuyanakpak.